Hey everybody, this is Steve with another episode of Keep Em Rolling, and I'm going to keep this intro incredibly short because this video is already pushing 35 minutes in length. This video covers the military memorabilia of one Thomas C., who was in the 6th Army, 6th Infantry, and this was a video requested by one of you. So, sit back and enjoy. Technical Sergeant Thomas C., pictured here, was born on February 11, 1909 in Chicago, Illinois. Around 1934, near the age of 25, he moved to Niles, Michigan, where he took up employment with the Conier Company, a company well known for its aluminum fabrications. Known by everyone as someone who was always smiling no matter what the situation, he met and married the love of his life, Alice, in 1939, and they had one daughter. Once World War II began, the Conier Company changed to a war footing, as so many companies across the United States did at this time. Being well-versed in aluminum fabrications, the company would produce around 300 different aircraft assemblies, turning out thousands of items by the war's end. As a manager, Thomas was deemed an essential war worker. This status would cause him to be deferred from the draft not once, but twice, with the reasons being given, one, his war worker status, two, his age, mid-thirties, and three, his dependents, wife and daughter. This would all change in 1943. Thomas C. would finally be drafted. Inducted at Fort Custer in Battle Creek, Michigan on October 5, 1943, Thomas was the oldest man in his company by far, so much so that he was immediately assigned the nickname of Pops, a nickname that he kept throughout the rest of the war, and he was often approached by the younger men for advice. He was assured over and over by the higher-ups that due to his managerial skills and his age, he would not be going overseas, and even if the slim chance arose that he did, he would be utilized as a desk jockey and not see combat. But the Army works in mysterious ways, and instead, Thomas C. was assigned to the Headquarter Battery, 1st Field Artillery, 6th Division, 6th Army, and would end up spending 30 months or two and a half years overseas, most of it in heavy combat conditions. He would also end up receiving one invasion arrowhead and two campaign stars on his Pacific ribbon bar. The images seen here are all from Thomas's personal collection and were taken by him during fighting throughout the South Pacific. After the war, Thomas returned to Niles and to his job at Conier. He would remain in Niles until 1994, when he would relocate about an hour north to Kalamazoo, Michigan. He would pass away in 2008 at the grand age of 99. His daughter stated that her father was both proud and yet humbled by his service in the Army during World War II. These are the military artifacts of Thomas C. Due to the sheer size of this grouping, we're going to break it down into different pieces, starting with the uniform parts. This image right here, this is the image that was in the introduction. This is Thomas C. And I love this image because it's hand colored and it's still in the original glass frame. Um, whenever I acquire a grouping or a uniform, I always ask the people if they have an image of the person who wore the items. Um, that they'd like to share. Uh, you know, I have no problem taking a photo of it or photocopying it. A lot of times they'll, you know, if they have extra, they'll give you an image. And I suggest that if, you know, you have the ability to do this, do this, because having an image of the person who wore the uniform or carried the gear, etc., it just adds that dimension. You know, it takes it from kind of a faceless thing to something that's, that's real, that this, this, this guy existed. You know, he served our country during World War II. Now the uniform itself, we have the enlisted visor cap, we have the OD shirt and tie, we have the Ike jacket, and then we have some miscellaneous items. We also have the trousers, which aren't on display here, but let's go through this up close. For the cap, what I love about this cap is this cap appears to be a custom piece. You can see that it's done out of the officer material, that kind of dark elastique material, and it's got this wonderful, wonderful purple lining on the inside. And you can see how different it is in color to the um, weave of the standard OD Ike jacket. And what's interesting is this cap plus his overseas caps 
are made out of that same material. And if I had to guess, I, I believe he picked these up while he was at um, the Field Artillery Replacement Center in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. That's, that's my best guess, so before he went overseas. So we have the enlisted visor cap that's in excellent condition. As I said, the OD shirt and khaki tie. And then for the uniform, on the ice jacket, we have his collar discs here, U.S. and artillery. And then these are your standard uh, clutch back discs. Working our way down the uniform, we have his discharge emblem right here, AKA the ruptured duck. And then over on this sleeve, we have the 6th Infantry insignia. And then over here, we have the 6th Army insignia. I love these double patched jackets. They tell such a story, don't they? As far as rank, we have Technical Sergeant on both sleeves. And then his ribbons, we have Good Conduct, starting right here. So Good Conduct, next to that is American Defense. And then we have his Asiatic Pacific ribbon. You can see on there that he's got an arrowhead and then he's got two stars. Now, I'm trying to figure out his campaigns because he was overseas for quite a while. So I'm not sure, the stars look different in color and that can be the difference between uh, two campaigns and six campaigns. So I'm trying to figure that out right now. Next to that, we have the World War II Victory, and then we have the Philippine Liberation Ribbon with one star. And that star was given out um, if you participated in an engagement against uh, the hostile Japanese forces during the liberation of the Philippines, which he did. Now over his shoulder here, we have a really nice brass whistle. You can see on there that it's stamped military. Still works. Let's give it a try. Sorry about that. I love that these still work. Sounds of World War II. Um, we have his dog tags. I'm not going to pull them out just because, I, once again, I'm trying to keep his name uh, private for the family's sake. But what's neat is we have, the, we have one dog tag. I don't know where the other dog tag uh, ended up going. Um, and then we also have his can opener. And this is the true World War II can opener, and you can tell because this ridge goes all the way across. Later ones, the ridge ends and it kind of curves off at either end, but if it goes all the way across like this, that's a World War II version. There was also something else on the dog tag chain that fell off. There was just pieces of it left. I believe that it was a good luck charm. I really wish I knew, but um, you know, that's been lost. As we come down here, let's go to the cuff. You can see that we've got uh, one, two, three, four, five overseas bars. So that's one year, two years, two and a half years overseas. And I don't believe there's anything on this cuff. The jacket's in excellent shape. There's just one tiny little kind of moth hole down here, but overall just a beautiful jacket that displays so well. Now coming down here to his overseas caps, we have this one right here, and the DI, or descriptive insignia on the side here, is for the, um, as I mentioned earlier, it's the Field Artillery Replacement Training Center out of Fort Bragg. And my guess is that's where he went for his artillery training and then was shipped off overseas. And you see the cap is piped in red for field artillery or artillery. We also have an additional cap, and you can really see the darkness. Let me hold, let me hold this one up just once again so you can kind of see the the contrast between the two uniforms. It's really cool. Down on the table, as I said, we have another overseas cap. This one does not have a DI on it. We also have a khaki overseas cap, or the summer cap. Um, the items on display on the cap, we have three toothpicks and one small pen knife. These items were actually found in the pocket of his uniform. And I encourage all of you who collect uniforms, 
go through the pockets carefully. I mean, you don't wanna just be jamming your hand down in the pocket because you never know what you're gonna find in there. Take your time, carefully go through the pockets, and you never know what you're gonna pull up. Um, I just acquired a tunic, for example, that was missing a button. And I kind of felt around in the pockets and, you know, on the outside and I didn't feel anything. I'm like, ah, oh, too bad. Sometimes if a button falls off, it gets put in the pocket. Well, later I took my time and I went through the pockets and lo and behold, tucked way down in the corner, was the missing button. So take your time, you never know what you're gonna find. And I love things like this. I mean, even though it's a toothpick, ladies and gentlemen, that's a toothpick from World War II. That's a toothpick that he put in his pocket here. At some point, he was at a restaurant or the PX or someplace, grabbed a couple extra, thought I might need some extra toothpicks, dropped them in his pocket, and there they've been ever since. These are the things I really, really love right here. Now, the extra insignia that we have with this uniform consists of an extra set of um, the overseas bars, so five of them. And then we also have two sets of the technical sergeant insignia. But what I love about this is these were in this envelope right here. And if you look at this envelope up close, you can see it's the NS Meyer Incorporated insignia. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been doing this for quite a few years and it always amazes me that I will learn something new every time I do this. You know, some people I think get really kind of full of themselves. It's like, I know everything there is to know. Not me. I believe that there is so much out there that you could learn something new about World War II every day for the rest of your life. And this was one thing that I learned. I did not know that Meyer, I, I'm aware of Meyer. I know they make, you know, like the really nice sterling uh, uh, wings and etc. for uh, the um, Army Air Force. I know that they've done uh, insignia that's like your collar insignia for officers and things like that. You know, you'll see this insignia on there. I did not know that they made uh, cloth insignia. And there's no way of telling that. If these were just loose in a box, you know, there's nothing on here that says N.S. Meyer. So that was an amazing find and you know some of you may already know this and good for you but for those of you who don't I mean I was gobsmacked so this is the cloth portion of the collection of Thomas C next we're going to move on to the personal items carried by Thomas C during his service in the United States Army during World War II and we're going to start with his button polishing kit now I've seen these containers at antique shops and flea markets, but they're always empty. And on here it tells you it should have polish, a brush, a cloth, and a board. And when I opened up his kit, we have polish, a brush, a cloth, and a board. It's complete. Amazing. And the way this worked, pretty simple. You have this board. It's actually a piece of celluloid. And it's got this slit in it. And you want to polish a button. So what you do is you'd slide this over the button. So the button's poking out of the top here. It shank is through this hole attached to the uniform. And this protects the uniform from getting polish on it. You then take the brush. You dab it in the polish. And I was going to open this and show all of you, but it's fused shut. So no luck on that. But you dip the brush into the polish. You'd rub it onto the button. And then you take the cloth and you buff it off and now you've got a nice shiny button or really, you know, any brass you need to shine, you could use this kit for. Just amazed that it's complete. And you can see clearly that it has been used. Next to that, we have a PX purchase uh, service button bag. These are things you could acquire at the PX or a loved one could acquire for you and send to you. And it would have a variety of buttons in there. So if you lost a button off a shirt or a pair of trousers, uh, they're in here and you could replace that yourself. You know, this is the army. You're not going to walk down to the sergeant and say, a button fell off my shirt. Can you please fix it? You would do it yourself. This is probably the most amazing thing I found in this grouping. And that is his toothbrush and his tooth powder. Now, I don't know about all of you, but I don't have a toothbrush that's a year old, much less 70 plus years old. And my guess is that um, this was probably in his personal items. And when he got back, it just stayed there. And that's where it's been ever since until I am showing all of you. So just a cool, cool item. Below that, we have a really nice set of dice. And then, down here, we have this game. And, you know, once again, 
this grouping just keeps amazing me. What this is here, um, there was a company out of Grand Rapids, Michigan called Durkee and Sons, and they made these pocket games. Here's a list of them right here. So you had chess, checkers, backgammon, solitaire, dominoes, cribbage, etc. And they made them in these really tiny sets. And just for scale, you know, here's my hand. So that gives you an idea of, of the size of this set. And they would put them in these mailers. So someone could purchase this at the local five and dime and mail it to their uh, loved one or to their service member. Um, or these would be sold at the PX. So you could pick one up. This one is complete. It's chess. We've got all the pieces. And what they do is they fit in this little drawer right here, which then slides into the board to protect them. And then this all closes up. And we also have all the literature that can be stored in here as well. Um, so, you know, this kind of gives you an idea of what games they offer. This is instructions for how to play and then some other information. It is 100% complete. And, you know, once again, I have chess sets that are huge that somehow you end up with a missing piece. These, I mean, look at the size of these little tiny pieces. And they're plastic. So, I mean, very easy to break, but they're all here. You know, something like this, though, you can imagine having something like this in the field and how this would just help pass away the hours that you were stuck doing nothing. What we have here is some of the miscellaneous insignia that was included with Thomas C's grouping. And let's go through just kind of item by item. These three medals right here are actually reissue medals. Um, we have Good Conduct, Asiatic Pacific with the uh, arrowhead and two stars, and we have the World War II um, Victory Medal. These were something that he received way after the war ended. And it's something that you can request. As a service member, you can request your medals. You have to provide, of course, proof that you received them. But the government will send you medals. And if they have old ones in stock, they'll send you those or they'll send you restrikes. And these are all restrikes. These are the types of things you could hang in a shadow box, if you will. Next to it here, however, we have his actual World War II issued Good Conduct Medal. We have the medal, which is engraved to him. We have the ribbon, and we have his button up there that would be worn in the lapel of a civilian suit if you so desired. But what makes this above and beyond a normal Good Conduct Medal? Because you see these out there once again at antique shops and so forth. But being engraved is really cool, but we also have the paperwork. He saved the paperwork from May 1945 that lists all the individuals and what awards they were being given. And he's listed in here as receiving this Good Conduct Medal, which is just outstanding. Now above, we have an extra piece of collar insignia for artillery. We have two of the, uh, once again, um, buttons, if you will, the discharge emblems or ruptured ducts. And these were quite important because as the war was winding down, if you were discharged from the war, even in those points after, wearing one of these on a suit immediately told people that you served in World War II. Um, and this was important if you were going for a job interview. You'd put that on your, uh, in the buttonhole of your suit um, up on the uh, lapel. And uh, people would immediately know. So maybe the person who's interviewing is like, oh, you were in the war. Ah, you know, and it was like a leg up. So uh, kind of that fraternity or sorority, if you will. Next to that, we have a civilian item. Actually, we have two civilian items. We have this really neat little celluloid button, long may it wave, which my guess was worn by his wife, Alice. And then next to that, we have this really cool piece of sweetheart jewelry. This is for the 6th Infantry. You can see the... the uh, star there. And then on there, it also has the star for the um, uh, in service. So this shows you that um, your loved one was serving or their loved one was serving in the 6th uh, 6th Infantry. Just a neat little piece. Once again, probably worn by his wife, Alice. She might have pinned it on her daughter's uh, dress or whatever. You know, who knows. But just a neat little collection of miscellaneous insignia included with this group. As far as paperwork goes, this grouping does not disappoint.
there's so much to show you. I guess we'll just jump right in with this right here. Uh, what we have is an I surrender document. These were dropped on the Japanese lines by um, the U.S. forces. And it basically says this leaflet guarantees humane treatment to any Japanese desiring to surrender. Take them immediately to your nearest commissioned officer. This right here reflects a big problem that was occurring in the South Pacific, and that was the lack of prisoners. Um, they just weren't around, and not having prisoners meant you didn't have people you could question to figure out troop movements, troop numbers, and so forth and so on. Uh, it, was a hope, it was hoped that dropping this on the enemy lines uh, would get them to surrender, and it was hoped that this being brought to a soldier would guarantee that that prisoner would make it to someone who could then question them. And this shows you the thoughts that were going on at that time. First of all, you were dealing with the Japanese code of honor that it was better to die in battle than surrender. So you just didn't see the Japanese soldiers surrendering. Then you had the problem of suspicion, and there were a lot of instances where a Japanese soldier would pretend to surrender and then at the last minute attempt to kill the people that were going to take him prisoner, either through a knife, a concealed weapon, a hand grenade, and so forth. Then you ran into the problem of just extreme hatred. And so if someone did surrender, there was a really good chance that they would not make it from where they surrendered to an officer, that someone would uh, meet out some sort of summary justice to them. Um, so it was hoped that these right here would um, somehow allow more prisoners to be taken, and it, it really didn't work. But uh, this was amongst his scrapbook, so it was just neat to see. And I do have it on a two-sided frame here, so when you flip it over, you can see the information on the back. And we'll get into the surrendering in just a little bit more here in just a minute with something else that he did have um, in his collection. Over here, starting on the left, we have this uh, Free Philippines newspaper. It's just a one-page sheet, but it talks about uh, what was going on with the surrender uh, process with the Japanese. Up here, no good South P uh, Pacific collection would be complete without Japanese currency, this occupation currency. This stuff is everywhere. I mean, you still see a lot of it out there today, and he has a nice stack of it. Um, it is literally not worth the paper that it's printed on, unfortunately. In fact, if you Google occupation currency, there are a few bills who, you know, that are worth some money. Overall, not worth much. Um, and when the liberation of these areas happened, you would see streets filled with this. This is why the, the soldiers brought them back. Um, it was easy to uh, transport. You could put a bunch of it into a, uh, you know, a book, your pocket, what have you. You didn't require special paperwork for it, so it became one of those easy to bring home souvenirs. Now here we have his scrapbook. Um, this was put together, I assume, probably by his wife because there are a lot of things that were mailed to her. Uh, this contains postcards, enlistment papers, ration books, letters, photographs, just a whole bunch of really, really cool things re reflecting his service uh, during World War II. Um, over here on the left, tucked in there, were a couple of booklets. We have the, uh, this is the uh, First Aid for Soldiers Field Manual. We have Camouflage for Field Artillery Manual. Um, this one's actually really cool when you open this one up and look through it. It actually has a lot of great colored pictures on how to do camouflage. We have this little piece right here I pulled out. Um, some of the stuff in here is glued in. Some of it was just loose, and this little piece was loose. Uh, basically, it's Welcome Home, San Francisco Port of Embarkation, Camp Stoneman. I uh, present this card at Mess Hall for a steak dinner. I do not know if he presented it and was allowed to keep it or if he just stuck it in his wallet, which it looks like he did, and then that's where it lived and he never got his steak dinner. We have ration books. And then this page right here I, I pulled up just because while he was overseas, he captured Japanese film. And these are some of the photographs that he brought back with him that are quite fascinating. But you can see the thickness of this book and it's virtually full of really cool items. Now as we progress here to the right we have a couple of uh, Bibles that were his. We have a My Life in the Service um, little diary and you know you see these all the time and I have yet to see one filled out by 
uh, a soldier. In other words, keeping track day to day of what they were doing. Um, all Thomas C. did in this one is he put his name, serial number, and then took a lot of names and addresses of the buddies that he went through training with. So it's neat that he at least did that. Now these right here are fascinating. We have three notebooks. Um, these two right here, they're actually done by the Coca-Cola Bottling Company. And I wanted to show all of you these because a lot of times when we're out collecting, we come across, let's say, a box of uh, paperwork at an antique shop. You know, it's got postcards, photographs, etc. in it. And you'll see these little pocket notebooks. Take a moment and look in them. Um, I tend, we tend to just kind of blow by these. We just assume they're nothing special. But I have found more often than not that they're filled with information from World War II veterans. It's really, you know, something they used to keep track while they were going through their training, and Thomas C. did just that. When we open these up here, or try to open them up, you can see that they are just filled. This is about the rocket launcher. Gives you all sorts of tips about it that he took notes on. So this whole, this whole booklet here is filled by him, and then as well as this booklet here, tons of notes, and then this little flip booklet here. Tons of really, really good information. This right here, see if we can get it to show up. This one is um, gas sentry, nose wear. It's, I'm, I'm trying to read it through the phone. It's not working. Um, man sleeps, will not sound alarm. APM chemical agent is a, or a, yeah, it says a, a chemical agent is a, substance used on war when you know uh, well you get the idea trying to read through the phones not that easy so um but take a moment if you're in an antique shop at a flea market someplace like that look in the notebooks don't just uh, go by them because you never know what cool things are going to be found inside of them now moving on here to finish up we have this fantastic book called the soldier's guide to the japanese army and in here is a ton of information on the Japanese soldier, the weapons they carry, um, their silhouettes, their uniforms. Um, you can see right there. Profiles. I mean, it is really, really a cool booklet. That was kind of a dramatic pause. Sorry about that. And then down here we have two wallet cards. And I love these because both of these have been coded in... Um, almost like a wax paper, or not wax paper, a wax material, if you will, to give them a bit of water resistance. And you can see it's got a little bit of a sheen to it. And like this card here, it's basically Japanese terms. Same with this one here. This paper also has kind of a, a waxy cover to it. But if you look, it's like surrender, and it tells you how to say it. So it's kosan sero. Halt is tomare. Come forward is Kochi koi, hands up, te ho agro, undress, kimond o nuje, we won't kill you, kos, nai, korasa nai. And, you know, when you look at those terms, this gets back to this leaflet that we saw here. When you look at these terms, surrender, pretty uh, straightforward, halt, come forward, hands up. The undress part, that's one that you might be going, why would you need to know that? And that was, once again, that fear that you're hiding something, that the Japanese soldier was hiding a hand grenade, uh, an improvised explosive device, um, a knife, a pistol. So what they would do is they would have the soldiers undress, and then they would inspect them before they would allow them to come any further forward. And you can tell this little card was probably carried with him during his entire time in the South Pacific, as was this one here. You know, just a unique little piece. And what gets me so excited about finding things like this is, once again, you know that that was there. You know, this overseas cap, it's neat, but it most likely didn't travel with him everywhere he went, where this little card most likely did from the time he got overseas until the time he got home and put it away. But as you can see... The paperwork really helped me kind of round out who exactly Thomas C. was. The last chapter in the Thomas C. grouping is the field gear that he was allowed to bring home with him. And, you know, this is something that's always fascinated me because I've spoken with numerous GIs who have told me that, 
you know, everything from they were allowed to keep anything they wanted to they had to turn everything back in. Um, I've spoken with veterans who've stated that as far as war souvenirs were concerned, uh, they couldn't bring them home or uh, they'd have to go through extensive paperwork to bring them home. Or in one case, uh, they told me that a warehouse had been constructed where they stored all the stuff. Their names were called. They were allowed to go in, pick what they wanted, and the military actually shipped it home, no questions asked. This included rifles and, and bayonets and knives and so forth and so on. So it seems to be all over the place. I guess it depends on who your officers were, uh, you know, when you were being discharged, where you were being discharged, uh, you know, what time it was. Was it near the beginning of the war, middle of the war, end of the war, so forth and so on. But regardless, these are the items that he brought home with him. And we'll start over here on the right. We have a complete shelter half. This includes the shelter half. It includes the uh, five stakes here. It includes the folding pole. And it includes the um, tent uh, loops, if you will, for putting the stakes through and the guy rope for setting this up. This is the complete set. This is what a GI would carry. Um, amazingly enough, I'm surprised that this stuff is still with it. Usually that's, that's lost. Um, if you don't know the shelter half, the way it worked was a GI was issued one half. So you had one half of the tent, you had one half of the pegs, one half of the pole, and then the ropes for your, your shelter half, if you will. And then what you would do is when you would bed down, you would get with your buddy, you would button the two halves together, use his stakes and your stakes, his pole and your pole, and, that, and you could set up a pup tent. Without it, you had half a tent, but you could still rig it up. I've seen pictures of uh, GIs who have rigged up half a tent, and I can't imagine the South Pacific uh, not needing a tent to kind of get yourself out of the, uh, the um, heat and the sun, if you will. I've seen guys rig these up just as shebangs, if you will. That's kind of the Civil War term for just basically a canvas covering. So, But we have his shelter half. Back here, we have his canteen. It's a nice canteen. It's dated, I believe, 1943. It's got the cover, it's got the canteen, and it's got the cup, so it is complete. Moving on, we have his pistol belt here. And with his pistol belt, we have a first aid kit. I've taken it off the belt at this time. We have a first aid kit uh, with a wax-coated um, insert and a pair of scissors, and I liked seeing the scissors in here. It was kind of a pleasant surprise because I've talked to GIs who have said that they would take uh, scissors wherever they could get them and put them in their uh, field kit, if you will, uh, their, their uh, Carlisle pouch, if you will, just to have an extra tool, you know, to poke, to cut, whatever you needed it for. Um, one GI told me the scissors would often come from the PX if they could get them or from a uh, sewing kit. If someone sent a sewing kit from home, they would take the scissors and then put them in their uh, first aid pouch. So it was nice to find those scissors stuck down in that first aid pouch. The belt is just your standard pistol belt. We do have this, um, I believe it's 1945 dated... Um, uh, carbine pouch. It looks almost rigor made with this extra flap here. At first I thought it was a 45 magazine pouch, but clearly I put one of my uh, uh, carbine magazines in here and it clearly fits it with no problem at all. So that was on his pistol belt. Down here in front we have the ubiquitous machete with the green, uh, I don't know if it's baked light or not, but the green OD green handle. Um, this is dated 1945. I should have had this out so bear with me here. We'll you can see, as I'm standing in the light here, you can see the markings here on the blade, US. It is 1945 dated, as is uh, the cover. And you can see the corrosion on this. So this has seen exposure to the weather. The metal is extremely corroded, but in solid shape. As we move back here, we have a wrist compass with the canvas um, wristband. I don't know why he would need a wrist compass. Um, you know, being in the field artillery, I don't know if he used this for sighting in. I don't know if he used this for direction or what have you. But regardless, it was part of his grouping. And then we have his cap, a nice HBT cap. It is seen use. You can see, you know, that it's it's a little, it's not salty, but it has definitely, definitely been used. You can see the sweat stains and so forth and so on on the cap. You know, I've been collecting groupings for quite a while, and 
you know, usually the grouping is the uniform and some paperwork or the uniform and some miscellaneous booklets and such. Rarely have I come across a grouping that has contained field gear with it. And um, that just, you know, it blew my mind to see that with this grouping. Well, everybody, I hope you enjoyed this video about the life and memorabilia of one Thomas C. It was really a fantastic experience to be able to work with his daughter, to be able to go through all of his memorabilia. You know, it's quite an honor to be able to do that. And that's really um, why I do this is to, you know, do the research, to meet different people and to really share it with all of you. So upcoming videos. We have a video that will be coming up here later this week that's a recent find video. And then I'm going to have a video this weekend that is on how to prepare for the show of shows. Because ladies and gentlemen, the show of shows is two weeks out. So we'll have some more information on that in the next because this video has gotten way too long. And I want to end it here. So everybody, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. And this is Steve reminding all of you to keep them rolling.